Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. So I know some of you are here today for your uh, 50th, 50-year uh, uh, reunion. Others for your five-year reunion, perhaps. Uh, and I think something we can all agree on, regardless of our generation and exactly what that means, is that we've lived through you know, an unprecedented uh, um, scope of globalization in recent times. And so you know, it doesn't surprise us anymore to see pictures like this one, where containers are lined up to receive the goods of this, that this country is sending to the, the wider world, and to contain the goods that this country is receiving uh, from that wider world. Uh, we're used to seeing pictures like this one of the recently expanded Panama Canal, uh, often called one of, the, uh, one of history's greatest engineering achievements. Um, and we're used to seeing pictures like this one that remind us of uh, you know, the role that international trade and the things that it brings into our economy play in our daily lives. But of course, you know, recent times have reminded us that uh, many things disrupt trade as well, that you know, globalization uh, grows and also shrinks. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are blockages that get in the way. Uh, and sometimes, of course, there are actual blockades, uh, like this one, where, uh, you know, to this day, um, uh, the port of Odessa, uh, which exports uh, you know, food grains that feed the, the mouths of millions of hungry people, poorest people around the world, is currently being blocked. So I uh, began my studies as a, a student interested in physics, and I uh, saw stories like these about the sort of the role that trade plays in our lives, and I, I have to admit they are kind of what pulled me into economics, and I, and I um, have spent my time since trying to figure things out, and I'm going to tell you today a bit, a bit about some of that. I'm going to draw in particular on a, a kind of recently accepted paper that I've written with some colleagues in particular with uh, Arno Costino, who's a fellow uh, a professor here in the economics department. Um, and we're going to kind of try to walk you through the way that economists, like uh, the analysis I, I'll be showing you, sort of think about the impact of trade on people's livelihoods. And I'm going to start with basics. And, and basics would, in MIT speak, uh, get called 1401. Uh, some fans in the room, that's good. Uh, <laughs> so principles of microeconomics, some of you may remember it fondly, and others may not remember anything, uh, but I will um, try to remind you of some of the basics. The, the basics look like this. There's a producer and there's a consumer. Uh, the producer is a factory, the consumer is a dinner plate. And that's kind of where 14101 takes off and, and uh, elaborates a great length about the, this kind of simple exchange between a producer and a consumer. 1402. Uh, <laughs> Maybe fewer fans in the room, but nevertheless, um, 1402, uh, Principles of Macroeconomics, kind of reminds us about wider connections between uh, firms and the economy. In particular, would stress that you know, fir no firm stands alone. A firm relies on the, the human and other resources that it draws on. And in particular, it draws on the skills that some people provide. It draws on the ideas that maybe the entrepreneur or the innovator provides. It draws on the capital, the financing that investors provide, without which the firm probably would be nowhere. And so those people are involved in production and hence delivery to consumers via the fact that they provide the inputs that, you know, that go into the firms, of course. So what about trade? Well, that, that in MIT speak is called uh, 1454, uh, Introduction to International Trade, our undergraduate class in the field. And of course, this invites us to consider two countries, uh, maybe one that you care most about, because it's where you live or something, uh, the United States, and a wider world with a border between them. And of course, the interactions that get studied in 1454 are pretty simple. Uh, there's sort of one uh, that we start with, which is importing. So there's a foreign factory that provides food and other bounty for our domestic consumer. And of course, there's exporting too. And we could illustrate that like this, where a firm or a farm in our country you know, exports something directly to foreign consumers. And that's sort of the, the basics of uh, 1454. So when we, uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, not to be forgotten, people are behind that farm just as much as they're behind a firm that makes things for the domestic consumer. Uh, okay, so when we turn to the postgraduate uh, version of this course, we often stress kind of wider mechanisms that, that have that this, the same roots. So uh, here I would uh, talk about this phenomenon, maybe most importantly, which is where a foreign factory provides inputs for a domestic producer, like this oil rig, which then sells things to the domestic consumer. So this is kind of a critical piece of any modern economy where much of what we import doesn't end up directly on our dinner plate, 
but it you know, helps our firms to make things for us, the domestic consumer. Another thing we talk about is, uh, is this one, which I, uh, you know, is a little bit more nuanced, but it's where a domestic firm on the right of this picture sells something to another domestic firm. And that second domestic firm is the one that exports. So, you know, in some sense, this first firm is not exporting. All it does is sell domestically, but it's just as much of an exporter as the farm here. You know, it, everything it does is it sells to the farm, and then the farm does the actual shipping across the border. But uh, without exporting, the first firm would be, would be nothing in this picture. Okay, so, uh, you know, taking this further, we can also talk, think about indirect forms of importing, like the one shown here. This is where a foreign firm sells something to one domestic firm, and then that second domestic firm sells something to, a, uh, a, a, to, a, to another domestic firm, which then sells it to the domestic consumer. So there's a sort of intermediate firm here that's not directly importing anything, but they themselves would be nothing without the fact that, that a fellow domestic firm is the one doing the importing, and we call that indirect uh, importing. Finally, as you can imagine, as in fact even features on some Seinfeld episodes, some firms do both. They import and they export. And, uh, and that's what this last firm is doing over here. They're just importing something to then send it back to foreigners in a transformed way. So this is a quick kind of summary of the way we think about the way trade it can impact people, the, you know, the people at the top inside your domestic economy. Um, and you know, just to summarize all that, there are people in green who are directly involved in uh, exporting. There are people in light green who are indirectly exporting. There are people in orange who are directly importing. There are people in light orange who are indirectly importing. And there are people in blue who are doing a bit of both, just like in the real world. Many people are engaged in both. Um, so this picture, of course, is embarrassingly oversimplified. You know, the real world would have more links. Uh, we can imagine that you know, firms do multiple things. They don't just sell domestically. They also export. Uh, some of these links are uh, showing up as I talk. But sometimes firms even sell and back and forth to the same firm, and goods go in cycles. We see that in our data. Um, but you know, the, the links can compound and, and can, can, can complexify the way we think about things until eventually we end up something that maybe looks like this, that might be a snapshot of the way a real economy works. Uh, and the red lines would summarize you know, all the interconnections in a networked economy. So this is the way economists think about trade. Uh, you know, the, the major problem with the way we think about trade is that there is no data on these red links. <laughs> you know, the way the data comes to us as economists is far more aggregated and far more coarse than our ability to actually see these red links. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about now is kind of a burgeoning attempt by economists, myself and my colleagues included, uh, to try to start to chip away at that gap in our data knowledge. Um, and this is going to draw in particular on one country where we've just kind of figured out how to make this work, and now we're kind of eager to scale it up to other countries where we can do it too. And I'm going to be doing this in Ecuador, uh, a country whose tax uh, system uh, and tax transparency works in a certain way that, they, that allows researchers to, to fill in all those red gaps that I, that I talked about earlier. So Ecuador is going to be trading with the rest of the world, lots all the other countries in the rest of the world in this example. And basically the way we see the Ecuadorian economy starts with seeing kind of each of kind of roughly three million uh, individuals who work at Ecuador's firms and half a million individuals who own Ecuador's firms or at least a share you know, thereof. We can then connect those individuals to the firms, the 1.5 businesses that are in our uh, Ecuadorian tax data, 1.5 million businesses that are in our Ecuadorian tax data. Um, and we can see how much those businesses trade with each other domestically, the, the, the crucial part of a modern inter, interlinked network economy. And then, of course, we can actually connect those firms to the domestic consumers, to the foreign consumers, that's the exporting, and back and forth, importing and exporting with foreign firms. Um, so I'm excited about the fact that we can finally do this. Uh, it took many years of, of hard work to kind of get access to the data, to be able to put it together, to be able to make sense of it. But we can actually now start to kind of learn some lessons from it. Uh, so I'll start with some basic lessons, just sort of some fairly, fairly descriptive lessons. Uh, I'm going to start with what I'm going to call export participation. And so in principle, we, we could take any one of those 2.9 million people, whether they're a worker or a business owner or a bit of both, and tell you how much that person is participating in exporting. Of course, I don't, have, I, I don't know people's names or anything. It's all anonymized. But, but far more interesting is to project all the people onto some common characteristic. And the characteristic I'll focus on today is the income distribution. So consider that the x-axis here, percentiles of the income distribution. And I'll plot on the y-axis the, the extent of export participation, which you can interpret as the share of people's income that they derive from exporting, both directly and indirectly. So it looks like this. 
uh, with the red, the, the X's being the raw data at the percentile level, the red line being a, a, a particular sense of smoothing across those 100 data points. Um, and I have to be honest, this completely shocked me. <laughs> Why? Uh, well, because what I expected was that it would be upward sloping. That was just my prior, my guess, based on existing knowledge and my own understanding of the way the world worked. Uh, what would upward sloping mean? It would mean that ex Ecuador's relatively rich people are the ones who are most export engaged, most export participating. Uh, in contrast, what actually we learned from the data is that it's Equ Ecuador's kind of middle class that are the ones who are, you know, the, who are most involved, most participating in exporting once you actually get the data on both ex uh, direct and indirect export linkages throughout the Ecuadorian economy. Um, the second thing we can talk about is import uh, connections. Here I'm going to stress what I'm going to call import exposure, which is actually going to be interpreted as going to be defined in a way that we think it's actually kind of economically bad or relatively bad to be import exposed. This is sort of, think about this as you, uh, you might work in a firm that sort of directly competes with foreign imports. You know, so that, that, sent, that form of import exposure would be bad. Some of these import exposures, however, are good. That would be where you work at a firm that is importing a part that is kind of complementary to you as a as human being, providing human capital or, or capital to that firm. So this is going to be the net of all those things, but it's defined in such a way that kind of having high import exposure is bad. Uh, and this one looks like this. Um, so this one surprised me too, uh, but, um, but it, uh, I can tell you what it means. It means that Ecuador's poorest are the ones who are most import exposed. Ecuador's richest are the ones who are least import exposed in this, in this sense. Uh, so that in a sense means you know, that, that while exporting was pro middle class, you know, importing is actually relatively pro poor, uh, so pro rich in this example, because the, the harm done by import exposure is less bad for the rich. Okay, so given that you know, I've sort of shown you some rough snapshots of how this looks, just the kind of first time we've been able to get access to data like these and actually see what it looks like in a real economy, you know, the, the next question is, okay, well, what would be the impact of like, changing the amount of trade that Ecuador does? Those were just snapshots based on the amount of trade it does. So what we're gonna do is kind of simulate, uh, you know, according to our analysis, according to our model, our understanding of the way the economy works, what life would be like if you took Ecuador sort of from no trade to the amount of trade they're currently doing. So let's call that like a globalization impact. You know, they're going from lack of trade to a lot of trade. And when I talk about such impacts, I'm gonna kind of sum, it's just a simple sum, two forms of such impact. The impact due to export participation that I've already shown you and the impact due to uh, import exposure that I've already shown you. And we'll just add them up. And it looks like this. I'm gonna focus for a second on uh, what I'm, income, sort of think about it as your, the income you earn as employees. So this kind of emits business profit earning for all people, it only counts their employee earnings. But what this basically shows us is that sort of um, export effect that was relatively pro middle class is overshadowed, over overweighed by, um, by the importing effect that was relatively pro rich. And uh, the net effect is by and large pro rich. When you add capital earnings to that, which is shown here in blue, it gets even stronger. You know, the, the, no surprise, the Ecuador's richest are the ones that tend to own Ecuador's businesses. According to our analysis, the effect on those businesses, those business profits, is very uh, much you know, positively affected on net by the access to trade, the access to exporting, et cetera. And so the gap between the red and blue tells you the sort of differential effect that's enjoyed by people who own businesses and provide capital to businesses. But it doesn't really overturn the story. The, the, the net picture is that uh, uh, gain, trading in ex, the impact of trading in, in a country like Ecuador could be good for everyone, but it would be particularly good for the rich, relatively good for the rich, by the tune of kind of 10% more than the median income earner. So that's kind of the main lesson that we've extracted from these data so far, the, the impact of a simulation like that. There's a lot more that we uh, you know, have done and are interested in doing. Um, I'll just give you a kind of very brief snapshot of some of that. So, uh, you know, the, the first thing we obviously want to do <laughs> is ask how this generalizes. Uh, we, we've got numbers we believe in for Ecuador, but what about the rest of the world? And so there's about 10 countries nowadays, uh, by our estimates, for which the data exists that one could kind of do exactly this kind of right now. Uh, and we're in the process of trying to do that, along with uh, collaborators around the world. You know, the... The next thing I'd add into our, our wish list, our to-do list, is uh, you know, incorporating other sorts of flows. I've stressed international flows that involve the exchange of goods and services. But we know that countries interact in lots of other ways. So they, of course, interact via people who migrate, either temporarily or permanently. 
um, by the flow of capital and other kind of know-how that we think that foreign firms, when they invest in a, in a foreign, uh, that when a domestic firm invests in a foreign country, they might bring expertise and know-how that spills over to the wider, to the wider recipient country. And that form of interaction or flow is, is missing here too. Um, the third thing we'd like to do is kind of apply the same data, the same analysis, the same machinery to kind of new phenomena. And uh, here I could just start with, for example, the phenomena that, that uh, my colleague Nancy was just talking about. Uh, you know, the study of competition, the study of how, how firms are competing and whether that's on net good for, uh, the, for efficiency involves the interconnectedness of all the firms in the economy. And uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that, that economists are now able to start to incorporate. And we, we, in fact, uh, Nancy and I were just talking about some students that are trying to sort of take that baton and, and run with it. Um, the final thing I'd say is kind of uh, new sources of data. So, you know, Ecuador's um, analysis and the analysis for other countries around the world is possible due to their tax systems. Um, we think that generalizes, it, 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 just to get you the basic idea, it works on the fact that these countries have a value-added tax. And so all transactions are, are sort of, uh, you know, taxed when they take place. So whether they're from firm to firm or firm to consumer, and so that allows a tax agency to sort of re re record them and, and, and uh, share them with researchers. But there are, of course, lots of other ways that economists and other analysts could start to understand the network economy. You know, there are sort of uh, digital payment systems or just good old-fashioned credit cards and bank accounts that allow us to understand sort of who from the consumer side is interacting with which firms via the purchases they make. Um, there are, uh, you know, da data from the, uh, the, the, the tracking of physical goods, the movement of goods, the Internet of Things that we're optimistic might be enabled to study this sort of thing. You know, satellite imagery is allowing us to see the movement of container ships in ways that was never possible before. Uh, I'm sure there's a gazillion other ideas for new sources of data, too, uh, that we have yet to learn about, but we're kind of eager to learn. And that, that really brings me to this. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we tend to sort of have this help-wanted view of research in our department that, um, you know, whether it's, you know, insights on countries where policies are, you know, policymakers need, uh, you know, lessons from analysis like this or, or, or interested in cooperating with researchers on their data to enable better science and better policymaking. Whether it's the, you know, insights about new types of flows, new phenomena that you think are important in the world economy or even new sources of data, uh, you know, from the kinds of uh, private firms and government agencies that you know of. Uh, we're eager to kind of hear about all that and get, get your thoughts. So I, I just end with my uh, email address. Uh, please uh, contact me if you, if you would like to. I'd, I'd cherish the opportunity. And uh, at my website there um, uh, is the, the a link to the paper where you can download the analysis that I talked about today. Thank you. I'll stop there. Where would you like me? Yes. Please. So Dave, th thank you very much. I was impressed when I hear that amazing amount of work you've done there. And so, so can I ask um, on the, um, I'm going to sort of start with, you know, you put together those many sources of data in Ecuador to get a view of the impact of trade in the Ecuadorian economy. Um, you sort of talk about more countries. Is that something that would be feasible to do for a country like the United States? Or what are, what are the sort of the obstacles that have led you to work in the Ecuadorian context? Um, so unfortunately, right now in the United States, the, there is no source of data that one could imagine as a census or the universe of all of these flows. Uh, the fundamental reason is that the US doesn't have a value-added tax. 75% uh, of countries in the world do. And so I'm optimistic that the US might be an outlier for which you know, we don't, the, the, the hope of having exactly that right tax data that would help us do this is not yet on the table. However, the, the US does, uh, the, the Census Bureau does uh, conduct a, um, a survey of uh, flows of goods uh, and services throughout the economy that doesn't give us this kind of universe view, but with the right you know, approach to the math and statistics that I think some people still have to work out, like, could be the right way to sort of treat it as a survey, a sample, a subsample with which to inform the, um, the, the, the right picture of the universe network. So I'm optimistic, but it's, we're not there yet. Yeah. Okay, so another question I got, I got a couple questions related to tariffs and tariff policies as a way to protect workers. So, you know, does your work on Ecuador let you sort of say something about what would happen if Ecuador tried to use tariffs to protect its workers and are you willing to draw any lessons for thinking about the role of tariffs in protecting American workers? Absolutely. It, so um, Ecuador has tariffs in place. Uh, we, in fact, in the paper study some of those tariffs. Uh, uh, the, the analysis I showed you here could be thought of as kind of uh, 
imposing like a prohibitive tariff, you know, an extreme tariff on everything, uh, or the, the the flip of that. But um, yeah, so the, you know, the basic way I'd think about it is that um, you know, think let's start by thinking about the import direction. Uh, you know, when we impose a tariff on some on a good that is directly coming into our consumer markets. That is kind of a tariff on import competition, and that, that's protectionism, the classic example that, that, that could protect workers. But you know, the, the danger that happens is that we tax those kind of goods that are coming in to help our firms to produce what they make. You know, sort of, so in my example, that was the, the foreign firm that's making like a part that my oil rig really needs. You know? and, and when we put tariffs on those things, we of course probably, we certainly harm our firms, we probably harm on average the workers and the owners of those firms too. Um, you know, no countries tend not to tax their exports. US, the U.S. typically doesn't do that. But equally, you know, no country can export without importing. Uh, you know, we know that's a basic lesson of kind of 1402. So, um, so whenever a country is taxing its imports, they're always taxing exports too. So we're, we're always, uh, you know, in, in that, that grander sense, kind of whenever we're sort of protecting some workers on the import side, if that's our goal, we're always harming some workers on the export side too. And that's something I would sort of, issue as a major caveat to thinking about protecting workers. Okay, and, and you know, sticking with the Ecuador topic for a second, you, know, you, you said you were surprised, or you, your expectations were that the, it wasn't going to be the low-income workers who gained more from the imports in Ecuador and vice versa, and then the net effects went the way they did. After having seen the results and having looked through the data, do you have intuition for why the winners and losers in Ecuador are who they are? Yeah, we, we think that a very important phenomenon is um, that thing I just stressed, which is sort of the uh, foreign firm, foreign economy uh, supplying, let's say, parts for the domestic economy that make domestic firms more productive or more, more competitive. And uh, it just so happens that you know, Ecuador's rich people tend to own and work at those companies that are doing that importing of parts. And we, we, we think that kind of, uh, that mechanism tends to trump all else. Uh, but the other surprise I mentioned, however, was on the export side. I had this image that, uh, you know, that it's the big firms, it's the sort of the superstar firms that are able to uh, ex successfully export to and, and kind of compete successfully in foreign markets. And as I had this prior, that it's the, it's the rich who work at and own those kind of superstar firms. And that's why I expected the export effect to be so pro-rich, whereas, you know, I was surprised it's not. That, that's not the way things work in Ecuador, evidently. So can I ask a question, you know, do you see, you know, in light of recent events, you know, we, we've had a lot of talk about globalization in the last decade or several decades, you know, do you see the world potentially deglobalizing? And if the world does deglobalizing, any thoughts on what the effects of that would be? I think on net, you know, the, the, the force for globalization has been largely technological, uh, not not so policy driven, you know, the, the digital exchange of stuff, uh, not just goods and services, but, but ideas and culture is, is immense and probably unstoppable is my own, <laughs> my own prediction. Uh, and so I don't see much that could revert that tide. Um, I could see uh, changes along the way. I think, uh, you know, maybe rightly, many countries are waking up to, to a heightened realization of risk. Uh, that they're all eggs in one basket kind of view of uh, how we source those critical foreign parts is starting to get challenged. And, and, and I, that, that's probably on large a good thing for individual firms to recognize that they need to diversify their supply chains uh, in the height of risk they didn't expect. And uh, for individual countries, especially small countries, possibly to, uh, to equally have that diversified view. That doesn't have to be deglobalizing. You know, diversification could involve more foreign production, just more different types of foreign sourcing, uh, as well as potentially more domestic sourcing. Okay, uh, in, in terms of work you've done, any insights on, uh, or could you do similar work to think about effects of carbon exporting and importing and uh, effects of energy and environmental effects of this uh, importing and exporting? Yeah, th that's, a, I should, I should have, that's a great idea. I should have, uh, <laughs> I should have stressed that. Um, so the way that you know, current proposals for uh, you know, carbon taxes, carbon markets, um, even just consumers knowing 
how carbon intensive is their consumption footprint, rely on the kind of network view that I sketched. So you, you would want to know, you know, of what, what's ending up on my dinner plate, you know, how much carbon is, it, is in it. And that depends on all those kind of indirect and indirect and indirect, possibly cross-border um, ways that the, the carbon or whatever other else that we're trying to avoid, it could be ethical, uh, you know, uh, ethical supply chains uh, that we might be interested in. It's exactly this network view that would allow one to do that. And, and so, for example, there are researchers in Brazil that are, um, that are trying to make it easy for consumers to understand, you know, when you're buying uh, beef that has a particular thing, you know, a particular number on the back of its packet, you know, a, a package of beef jerky or something, uh, that you kind of know what slaughterhouse it was sourced from and, hence, and whether that source, slaughterhouse tends to source its beef from um, land that was illegally deforested. And, and so that gives kind of that, that supply chain visibility is just another, another example of the type of thing that this connects to. Okay. I guess I actually have a few educational questions. I should say people probably don't know this. I don't know if there's in the bio that uh, Dave is actually currently also the head of our undergraduate economics program. Um, but so I had some questions that are of the form, um, you know, what is going on right now at MIT? Can you say anything about going on at MIT right now to sort of get insights on international trade and globalization to the potential entrepreneurs in Core 6 uh, and elsewhere? And, and uh, you know, where, where are people learning about this kind of material? Right, so the first thing I'd mention uh, is the, the new major, we, joint major we've created with Core 6. May, may, many of you may already know about that, but it's called 614. <laughs> it's, a, it's a joint major program that's about kind of economic computer science and data science, and it, and it is very much uh, in its genesis about sort of enabling students, MIT graduates, to, uh, to understand how to think about policy and business problems uh, with the help of huge data sets and with the help of kind of uh, mathematical and statistical tools, uh, and an example of which would be this. And so, yeah, one of the class I mentioned, 1454, is part of that uh, joint major program. Okay. Uh, and, and one final question, you know, I, I sort of emphasized earlier at the start of my introductory remarks is sort of credibility revolution and how we sort of emphasize causality in economics. Can you give us any sense of, you're showing this sort of, uh, your, you know, your effects of international trade on, on people at different parts of the income distribution. So, how, you know, what is it that you're doing or how is it that you're trying to sort of like get at what are causal effects of international trade on people? Can you Yeah, that, that's, that's a that? great, that's a very important question. So, um, the, the, our, our leverage on that is that we have six years of data. And I, I, everything I showed you was snapshots from the middle year, but we have six years of data. And Ecuador had uh, you know, a stream of kind of foreign events that uh, shocked, in some sense, the extent to which um, different products, different firms in Ecuador are able to, to sort of export and, and compete with imports. And so we use kind of what we hope are kind of, you know, as good as random, kind of foreign determined determin determin components of those events, kind of, you know, uh, foreign countries changing their tariffs, foreign countries' exchange rates, cha exchange rates changing unexpectedly, uh, foreign countries going through recessions or, or booms, uh, commodity pr discoveries, things like that. And we sort of look at the, as the foreign uh, shocks go up and down, we sort of actually try to sort of trace out what's the impact of that inside kind of firms in Ecuador, inside supply chains in Ecuador, and inside kind of connections between workers and, and owners and firms in Ecuador. So that's kind of our, our window. It, you know, it, it's not a perfect window. It's, it's just this kind of six years. <laughs> and admittedly, the variation that takes place in those six years is smaller than the variation that I showed you, which is like a dramatic uh, reduction in trade. You know? um, but still, we think it's critical to kind of discipline the device by, uh, you know, so that we make sure that our analysis is kind of you know, estimated so that everything in the model is calibrated exactly to match how the economy, the real economy, responded to those actual trade shocks that happened in sample. Thank you. That's very good. And so I guess I, I take it that in some sense maybe there the fact that Ecuador is a relatively small country helps you in having those sort of small shocks be exogenous to Ecuador. I think that's a plausible view. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are, yeah, there are, I don't think it's hopeless for large countries to find such events. Uh, you know, obviously this is a great segue to the, the work of our colleague Josh who really pioneered the way economists uh, think about those problems in general. And so they have been applied to very micro problems and also increasingly to very macro problems like this one, you know, the impact of globalization. And it's all due to the work of people like him. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.